Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another fantastic evening of Virtual Cafe Sci. My name is Colin Summerhauser and I'm the head of Hana House in Palo Alto. And over the course of the last few months, many of you have witnessed the transformation of Cafe Sci from an in-person event to a virtual experience. And it's amazing to see how far we have come since our very first session. And because I know many of you are loyal returning viewers every month, I just wanted to encourage all of you to expand your horizons and check out our other events that we host as well. We host free virtual events every single week focused on a variety of different topics, ranging from technology to design and more. Head over to hauntahouse.com events for the full lineup and for registration details. And with that, remember to use the interactive question widget on the bottom of your screen to ask questions throughout the presentation tonight and be sure to upvote the questions that you would like to see answered. And now I'll hand it over to our Cafe Sci lead, Kay, to introduce our amazing speaker today. Welcome to you all from Cafe Scientific Silicon Valley. Next month, on the third Thursday of September 17, we hope to hear from Dr. Elon Crew of Stanford on the interesting topic of air transportation redux. Redux means brought back or revived after this pandemic. Hope all of you can join us. But today, I am excited to introduce our speaker, Professor Catherine Nagler. Perhaps the only good thing coming out of this tragic pandemic is that we can invite speakers from far away. Professor Nagler, who studies how intestinal bacteria induce protective functions and reduce the ability of food allergens to cross the intestinal barrier, is from University of Chicago. She is also a co-founder and president of Clostrobio, a company dedicated to understanding and treating food allergens, food allergies and other diseases of the immune system. I have high hopes that her company and others will succeed and all sufferers will soon be able to enjoy the simple pleasures of eating all foods without being threatened by severe allergic reactions. Catherine Nagler graduated with honors from Bernard College, Columbia University. She obtained her PhD from NYU's School of Medicine and did a postdoctoral fellowship at MIT. She was an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School prior to joining the University of Chicago in 2009. Dr. Nagler serves in national and international leadership roles for many highly prestigious scientific societies. She also participates in numerous review panels. She has received many awards, including Distinguished Faculty Award from the University of Chicago. She, she was listed among Crane's Chicago Business Tech Top 50 Women in 2018 and Notable Women in Healthcare in 2019. Here is Professor Nagler. Good evening, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity to tell you about our work examining how we can manipulate the microbiome to prevent or treat food allergy. So as you probably know, food allergies have reached epidemic proportions. We now have 32 Americans 32 million Americans suffering from food allergies. That's one in 10 adults, one in 13 children. Um, many of these have experienced a severe reaction and that's a 377% increase just between 2007 and 2016. And I point out that this data, which is from Food Allergy Research and Education, this increase is based on, on insurance claim lines. So it's not self-reported, it's doctor diagnosed food allergy. People can be allergic to any food, but there are eight foods that cause the most allergic reactions as shown here. Um, some of these foods like milk, eggs, soy, and wheat typically induce a more transient reaction that's um, restricted to childhood. But peanuts, tree nuts, fish and shellfish are associated with lifelong, life-threatening allergic responses to food. 
every three minutes, a food allergy sends someone to the emergency room in the United States. So when I was a child, my brothers and I had peanut butter and jelly for lunch almost every day. By the time my children, who are now 28 and 24, graduated from elementary school, their classrooms were peanut free because of the striking numbers of children with anaphylactic responses to peanut. So this is a change in just one generation. And that's our main question. What's driving a generational change in food allergies? As I, I mentioned, the response is unpredictable. In a given individual, Food allergy can present as itchy eyes, itchy throat, swollen lips, hives or urticaria. These are kind of minor symptoms. On another day, it can present as wheezing, difficulty breathing, anaphylactic shock, which is respiratory cardiovascular collapse. So it's a very dangerous disease. Food allergy is typically associated with other allergic diseases. And they appear in a, in a, they often appear in a pattern that has been called the atopic march. So allergic dermatitis or eczema can appear at infancy and peaks in, in the first few years of life. Food allergy follows and is a disease of early childhood, usually presents around age two. Asthma typically develops at, at school age and allergic rhinitis follows after that. When we call it the march, we mean that many patients present with symptoms of all of these diseases, one after another in this kind of pattern. So in order to, to try to understand what could account for this generational change, we turned our attention to the microbiome, the microbes that populate our skin and mucosal surfaces and profoundly influence our health. I, I know that, that Michael Fishbach has already introduced the microbiome to this group, but um, I'll just go over a few points that I wanna make here. The first is that the genetic encoding potential of this microbiome which we still haven't characterized in full detail, is enormous. So while our genome contains 23,000 genes, the microbiome is estimated to contain over a million genes. And let's start by defining the microbiome. I'm going to be talking about only, really only about bacteria and bacteria in the intestine, but the microbiome is much more complicated. It's not just bacteria, but also bacteriophage, which are viruses, fungi, viruses, and in the developing world, protozoa and helminths. All of these live in an intermingled community that interacts with each other. And remember also, although I'm going to show you mostly sequence data, that these microbes we have to imagine them in three dimensions. So if you think about the intestine, the intestine is a tube. The bacteria that live close to the surface of the intestinal epithelial lining are going to have a very different influence on the responses in the body than those that reside, reside deep in the lumen. And they're all interacting with each other in ways we're only beginning to understand. But we do know that we exist in a dynamic interrelationship with our microbiome. Healthy individuals tolerate commensal bacteria, but they're also constantly receiving signals from the microbiome that impact both systemic and mucosal immune responses. So let me just highlight some of the many health benefits the microbiome confers to the host. Um, so you may not know that there are some essential vitamins like vitamin K that we cannot produce, our bodies cannot produce um, themselves. Vitamin K is made by bacteria in our guts and it's a cofactor for the synthesis of clotting factors in the liver. All of the fibers that we eat are essentially digested, they're fermented by bacteria in the gut we don't have the capacity to digest them ourselves. They're 
products, their metabolites, short chain fatty acids have powerful effects on the host, beginning at the epithelium itself where they're an important source of energy for the metabolism of the epithelial cells. But they have many effects, which we'll talk about um, later on the in the talk. Bacteria in our guts inactivate toxic substances that are produced by food or pathogens. By their sheer numbers, they prevent pathogens from gaining access to the epithelium. And what we're going to talk about most, we now are beginning to understand the many ways in which commensal bacteria interact with the host to influence the immune system, not only the local immune system in the gut, but throughout the body. So why suddenly in the last 10 years have we heard so much about the microbiome? It's because before that point, we weren't able to identify it. The only bacteria, and from this point forward, I think I'll be only speaking about bacteria. My work is focused on bacteria, but just keep in mind that the microbiome is much more complex than just bacteria. So, we only knew what turns out to be 10% of the bacteria that are present in our bodies. And that's because those are the ones that were readily culturable at 37 degrees. So yogurt type bacteria, lactobacilli. When we were able to develop culture independent methods of analysis is when this field exploded. And the method we used most commonly was based on a, on a fortuitous a coincidence of nature that the, a particular gene called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, which is schematized here, is highly conserved among all bacterial species, such that you can create primers that target conserved regions, sequence between those primers, and use that variable sequence for bacterial classification. And that's still the, the primary method we use to to taxonomically identify bacteria, the commensal bacteria today. So what some of this information has told us is that the composition of the microbiota varies tremendously by where you are in the body. So I will show you um, uh, actual data once we get past these introductory slides, which are, are a schema. And I'll be talking about different um, bacterial taxonomy. So you might remember back to high school biology, the orders of classification, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. This slide is showing you phyla, very high level of classification. And I make that point specifically to point out even at the phylum level, at this highest level of classification, the, the bacteria that populate the body are enormously different from site to site. So for example, hair follicles have bacteria. There are some bacteria present in the hair like cyanobacteria that aren't present at all in the gut, which is the home to the largest population of the bacteria in the body. It's dominantly, the gut is dominantly comprised of bacteroidetes and firmicutes, members of that phyla. But you can see that, that some parts of the body, like the vagina, is dominated by uh, um, lactobacilli, which are firmicutes. Other parts of the body are more diverse. So what's our hypothesis for how the microbiome is influencing um, allergic responses to food? And what we, I will argue is that our microbiota has changed in a generation. And that change has been brought about by modern industrialized lifestyle factors. This slide is from a recent review that we wrote about food allergy in the microbiome, but I could substitute or add to food allergy a whole list of diseases here, including autism, inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, um, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, all of which are increasing in parallel with food allergy, the, the non-communicable diseases of the 21st century. And they are all being influenced by the, the changes in the composition of the microbiome. So what are the factors that are causing these changes? 
Antibiotics, far and away, the biggest culprit, not only prescribed antibiotics, and American children get six courses of antibiotics typically before the age of two, mostly for viral ear infections, to, for which antibiotics serve no purpose. Um, not only the antibiotics to which we are prescribed, particularly early in life, but also the antibiotics in our, in our food and drinking water. So for example, you may not realize that up until recently, cattle were treated with low doses of antibiotics because the farmers observed that that made the cattle fatter and therefore more meat, more commercially um, profitable. Uh, some people have suggested that we've done that same experiment to ourselves and that the low dose exposure to antibiotics is part of what's driving obesity in the 21st century. Our ancestors consumed a diet rich in fiber, no processed foods, low in fat, very different from the fast food diet that's typical of many Americans. We've moved from rural settings where we were um, much more in communication with nature to urban and suburban living, sometimes in sealed buildings. So the diversity of our microbiota has decreased tremendously. Vaccine enhanced immunity has reduced our exposure to infection. And I'm compelled to stop here and say, I'm not in any way suggesting that vaccines are not the greatest public health success story in history. You probably saw in the newspaper yesterday, by vaccination, we've eradicated polio in Africa. Vaccine, I couldn't speak more forcefully in favor of vaccines, but you know that getting infected with a pathogen, say measles, being infected with measles affects your body very differently than getting vaccinated on, in your arm with the measles vaccine. So, and that has an influence on the microbiome. And then finally, the eradication of previously common pathogens that live in the gut, like helminths and helicobacter pylori. Taken together, all of these factors and others have changed the biodiversity of the bacteria in our guts in a way that's depleted beneficial populations. And I'll show you as we go forward, some of the populations that we've identified that we think we can start to address this problem. So our microbiota changes throughout life. We're sterile prior to birth. Nature's strategy was for us to be born vaginally. And the founder population of bacteria that colonizes a newborn infant is bacteria from the mother's vagina, which is largely lactobacilli. Babies that are born by C-section miss this founder population. And instead, it's been shown that C-section babies, um, you can actually trace their founder bacteria to other people that were in the delivery room, to the mother, to other people in the delivery room, and even to hospital-associated bacteria. And so C-section babies are at a higher risk of susceptibility to certain pathogens earlier in life and a higher risk of allergic disease. Early childhood is a time of enormous change for both the microbiome and the immune system. New strains come in. And remember that all of these bacteria are acquired from our environment. There's a rapid increase in diversity, all the early microbiota is very unstable and it changes in response to diet or illness. But eventually everybody acquires a fairly stable microbiota. It can change um, on a daily basis in response to what you eat, but it comes back to an individual baseline. And that microbiota is unique to you. It may change again in the elderly. So what we wanted to know was how does bacterial colonization change the response to sensitization to a food allergen? And now I'm going to, to first introduce some terms and then I'm going to show you some data. And I hope I can have prevent, present it in a way that the non-scientists in the uh, audience will understand. 
So I have this start with this slide because I don't want you to get bogged down in any of the jargon of immunology. And this is just to, to remind you that all of these bacteria, all of the other kinds of microbes, all of the food you eat, everything that's in your gastrointestinal tract is separated from the rest of the body by a single layer of epithelial cells. And so that layer needs some fortifications to prevent all of this varied uh, constituents from getting past the epithelium and interacting with the rest of the body beyond that surface. Some of the specialized adaptations of this barrier are tight junctions, which seal the epithelial cells to all but the smallest uh, molecules, a specialized subset of cells that produces antimicrobial peptides, natural antibiotics. Mucus, we call this, I call this slide mucosal immunology 101. Mucosal surfaces are all, all of the surfaces that, that are open to the outside from your, from your mouth to your anus are mucosal surfaces as is the urogenital tract. And they're lined with a layer of mucus as, as a physical barrier to keep these bacteria from getting close to the epithelial surface. And finally, there's a specialized form of immunoglobulin, part of the immune system, part of, called, the immunoglobulin mucosal surfaces is called secretory IgA and it's fortified so that it can resist the low pH of the stomach, all of the proteolytic digestive enzymes that are present in the intestine and still function effectively as in, in its immune protective roles. So this is the way we do these experiments. I debated about whether to include this slide, but I think it, giving you the schema will make it um, easier for you to understand the following slides. So in this first part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about a model of, of sensitization to um, food antigen. It's a peanut allergy model, but I won't show you symptoms of, of food allergy in this model because this particular kind of mouse um, doesn't respond symptomatically. In the second part of the talk, I will show you a symptomatic allergy model. So what we decided to do was to deplete the bacteria in the gut by starting uh, seven days prior to weaning, giving the mice by gavage, that means using a, 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 a needle to put the antibiotics into their stomach, a cocktail of, of antibiotics for seven days. Then at weaning, we put those antibiotics in the drinking water and we started sensitizing them again by putting a tube into their, into their stomach with peanut plus an adjuvant, something that, that induces an immune response. And we did that every week for four weeks before we challenged them intragastrically again with peanut the same way that would happen when a child goes to a clinic to be diagnosed for food allergy, they have an oral food challenge. That's the gold standard for reading out food allergy. And we sacrifice the mice the next day. So the question was, how does this uh, course of antibiotics change the composition of the microbiota when we look in the, in the feces? And this is what we found. So don't, don't concern yourself with all of these labels. I'm gonna walk you through this. In untreated mice, when we look at the fecal material, this is um, sequencing data. I told you in the slide um, where I showed you the composition of the microbiota in different parts of the body, that the gut is predominantly bacteroidetes and firmicutes. That's the red and the blue. Antibiotic treated mice, you don't see any of this pattern. Instead, you see that they have only Lactobacillaceae, which happen to be resistant to our antibiotic cocktail. So their community structure is totally destroyed. The community structure in the ileum, the last part of the small intestine where food is absorbed, is different from, from what you see in the feces. 
But again, it, the community structure is destroyed. This antibiotic treatment does not make, does not remove all of the bacteria in the gut by any means, but it reduces the numbers of bacteria by about two locks in both sites. And when we look at the production of peanut specific antibodies, we see that only the antibiotic treated mice make peanut specific IgE. So that's the, the antibody that causes allergic responses or peanut specific IgG1. So then of course we wanted to know which bacteria are important. And we're lucky at the University of Chicago to have a state of the art germ-free mouse facility. And that means we can raise mice in these flexible foam isolators. You may remember this kind of an isolator from uh, what was called the bubble boy many years ago. This is, you can raise mice inside these containment systems basically, and they never get colonized with any microbes at all. But it's a very cumbersome system you have to manipulate the mice by reaching in through these gloves and doing all of these gavages into the stomach and all of the different manipulations we need to do to the mice. Use with your hands inside heavy gloves, working, reaching into the isolator. Everything that comes into the isolator has to be sterile, both inside the tube, which is typical, but also outside the tube. So we have to bring everything into the isolators through a porting system where the outside of the tubes are decontaminated with, um, by different gas mixtures. So to identify allergy protective bacteria in this system, we selectively colonized mice with different bacteria and we chose representatives of both the bacteroides and the clostridia, the two dominant groups that are present in the gut. And what we found was that clostridia induce IL-22, a barrier protective cytokine. And we thought this was really important because IL-22 controls many of the functions that make, that fortify the bacteria, the barrier. It controls the proliferation of epithelial cells, the production of mucus, the production of antimicrobial peptides. So we wanted to see, well, first let's um, review what happens during an allergic reaction before I show you the next slide. And when a child, uh, as schematized here, say takes a, eats a cookie that has peanuts in it, and um, that food protein has to pass through the gut and get into the bloodstream, where it's going to be recognized by IgE, the, the antibody that mediates allergic responses. And if that IgE is bound to a mast cell, the cells that contain all of the mediators of the allergic response, the mast cells can release histamine. You know about histamine, you take antihistamines when you have an allergic response and other chemicals and induce the symptoms of allergy that we've already talked about. So it starts with the food protein getting out of the gut into the bloodstream. And what's surprising is that peanut is able to do that in an, get into the bloodstream in an undigested form. And this seems to be the characteristic that distinguishes the superfood allergens. So what we asked was, do clostridia, the bacteria that we identified as allergy protective, does their production of IL-22 reduce the ability of food allergens to get into the bloodstream? And this is the experiment we did. We did that antibiotic gavage again, and then at weaning, we either gave the mice a consortium, a group of different clostridia bacteria, or IL-22 itself, and then six days later, an oral food challenge. We used an assay for that's this, so this would be similar to what would happen in a clinic with a child that's food allergic. Oral food challenge, and then look at the bloodstream, 
for the presence of one of the dominant peanut allergens. So the scientific name of peanut is Arrakis hypogea, and one of the dominant allergens in mice and man is ARA H6. So this assay only sees undigested peanut allergens. And this is what we found. We looked for ARA H6 in the serum of the mice. Untreated mice had a little bit, then went back to baseline after three hours. This is, this is post-challenge. Antibiotic treated mice had a lot more and it kept climbing. If we gave the antibiotic treated mice Clostridia, we didn't detect the ARA H6 in the bloodstream. If we gave them IL-22, we didn't detect ARA H6 in the bloodstream. If we gave them the mice, antibiotic treated mice Clostridia, and then neutralized, blocked the IL-22 with an antibody, we could see the ARA H6 in the bloodstream again. So this said to us that yes, Clostridia induced IL-22 is necessary to reduce intestinal permeability to a food antigen. And that led us to hypothesize that protection against allergic sensitization to food requires a bacteria-induced barrier protective response. So until this point, we understood that tolerance to dietary antigens was composed of the induction of, of regulatory T cells specific for the food antigen, and that this was something that takes place in the draining lymph nodes. Agreed, that's definitely an important part of, of how you induce tolerance. But this pathway hasn't changed in a generation. How do you explain why we suddenly have 32 million Americans with food allergies? So our argument is that it's because we depleted protective populations of bacteria in the gut that have a very important role in maintaining the barrier, as I've just told you about. So the next step was to see, can we take this into patients? And our ultimate goal was to develop microbiome modulating therapeutics to treat food allergy. So we, in our first experiments, we teamed up with a group at the University of Naples and our collaborator, Roberto Bernie Canani, gave us fecal samples from 20 healthy infants or 20 calcium allergic infants. These infants were only um, four to five months old at the time he collected these samples. And right away, you can see a marked difference between the healthy and the calcium allergic infants. And I should mention here, uh, uh, the collaboration with Roberto was fortuitous. He was introduced to me by somebody at the University of Chicago but I think working with this patient population was actually key to our being able to pinpoint um, the bacteria so clearly because unlike an American clinic, this is a very homogeneous patient population. Uh, everybody is, is uh, there's no racial diversity, there's no ethnic diversity. Most of the people have been living in Naples for generations. Their diet is similar. And that's, I think, part of the reason we could see very clear differences between the cow healthy and the cow's milk allergic infants, even with this small sample size. So what you can see is that healthy infants, as we've known for many years, are dominated by the probiotic bacteria, lactobacilli and bifidobacteria. That's what made these probiotic bacteria that you can buy in any whole foods. Both of these populations are missing from the cow's milk allergic infants or greatly reduced. And instead, the cow's milk allergic infants have an adult type microbiota as if the normal population of the gut from in the first six months of life had somehow proceeded at warp speed in the cow's milk allergic infants. So since in food allergy, we don't have, we can't sample 
take big biopsies from the intestine like you can do in other diseases, celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease. We wanted to develop a really good animal model that we could use to understand the interactions between the bacteria and the host and also to test any uh, drugs that we develop. So what we decided to do was to transfer feces from healthy infants or from cow's milk allergic infants, as I showed you into the previous slide, into germ-free mice and sensitize those mice with a, with a cow's milk allergen, beta-lactoglobulin, and look to see what the result was. So this is the way we did this study. When you transfer human feces into mice, every, um, every organism has its own uh, specific microbiota. So the human bacteria, human adapted bacteria don't transfer perfectly into mice because usually they're missing the food that the human consumed that is what those bacteria eat too. But we had an advantage, our patients were infants. They were only consuming formula. So we gave the mice the exact formula that the infants were consuming at the time they, they produced the fecal samples. And that greatly facilitated the colonization of the mice with the human feces. And I emphasize this because if we don't faithfully transfer the bacteria from the, from the human to the mouse, we're not going to have a reliable model. And then we went through the same kind of protocol I've shown you earlier to sensitize the mice. And this is the result we got. This is, is an amazing slide. So for several reasons. First, this graph, well, all of these graphs represent 100 notobiotic mice, about a third in each group, all manipulated and sensitized in those isolators. And what we had eight different human infant donors four cows milk allergic, four healthy. Each experiment was done twice with seven to eight mice in a group. That's how you get to 100. And what you can see, I think pretty clearly, we're measuring hypothermia, a drop in core body temperature as an indication of anaphylaxis in mice. That's not a symptom that you see in humans, but it's the standard in mice. And what you can see here is that germ-free mice that have no bacteria have an anaphylactic response to the to sensitization with with the cow's milk allergen. So do the mice colonized with the CMA microbiota, but the healthy mice colonized with the healthy microbiota have no drop in core body temperature at all. The mice colonized with the CMA mi microbiota have a significantly increased production of BLG specific IgE as evidence that they're making a specific response to the cow's milk protein, as well as BLG-specific IgG1, and mucosal mast cell protease 1 is one of those products of the mast cells that causes symptomatic disease. Moreover, this slide is proof of concept that there's something in the healthy microbiota that we can discover and transfer to these mice as a way to, to prevent or treat disease. So of course, that's where we wanted to go forward. First, we had to find out what these bacterial populations were. And I just uh, included this slide to make the point that we looked at each donor, which is D, and their recipient mice um, for each mouse N is more than one. And we looked at exactly um, what bacterial populations were present. So you can see a pattern here of more red on this side. These are the protective, OTU means oxy, o, operational taxonomic unit. It's just a way of identifying bacteria, bacterial sequences without putting them into any taxonomic category at all. So here's a red cluster. These are the healthy donors. Here's a red cluster. These are the allergic donors. So we call these non-protective OTUs. And we were able to separate them out um, pretty clearly and show that the mice 
represented the human infant donors very well. We also looked at epithelial cells that we isolated from the small intestine of the healthy and the CMA colonized mice post colonization to look at changes in gene expression. And you can see what I'm showing you here is that there are changes in gene expression that are characteristic of the healthy colonized mice and the CMA colonized mice. We took those two data sets and integrated them together. And out of that, we found that there were nine OTUs that significantly correlated with genes upregulated in the ileum of the healthy or CMA colonized mice. And three of these were lactnosporaceae. Lactnosporaceae is a family in the clostridia. So we got really excited about that. We went to the database and found that the closest match for those OTUs is a bug called Anaristipes caseae, which is a known butyrate producer in the human infant gut. And this is just showing you the data. There's more Anaristipes caseae in the healthy than there is in the cow smoke allergic. There's a correlation. So then um, the reviewers of our paper said, well, then you're claiming that anaristipes casei is a special representative of the healthy um, infant microbiota, you should be able to transfer it by itself and show that it mimics the effects of the healthy microbiota. And it did. So here's mice that got just a casei compared to the complex cows allergic microbiota. You see that a casei is sufficient to protect we looked at all the other parameters I showed you before. Antibi this is not 100 mice. This is something like uh, 35 mice. Um, all of the other parameters, antibody responses, even uh, cytokines, which we didn't look at in the other uh, model, all pointed to protection by uh, colonization with AKC. At the time we were, um, published our study, another study completely unrelated um, came out that was looking at the microbiome in early childhood um, in a long-term study called TEDI, looking at the influence of the microbiome on type one diabetes. And they did a very, very detailed characterization, but characterization by repeated sampling of many, many infants and identified the 20 most characteristic bacteria of the early infant gut. And look who's on the top of the list, our friend Anerstipes casei. And it's, um, so before this, before this paper, our paper, there'd been one, one or two other papers that had ever even mentioned this bug. And it's also important in, as an age discriminatory bug, which means that if you look at an infant at a certain age, so here's the range from 10 to 40 months. You can, if you can look at the, the abundance of AKCA in their stool and predict how old that infant is. So we knew that AKCA was a very low abundance, only about 1%. And um, our infants were six months old in the, the ones we used to colonize the mice. And that agrees exactly with what they show here. See this dark blue. So then the take home message here is that there are a population, there is a population of bacteria that this um, author has called the peacekeepers of the gut. I'm arguing that this is the population that's been depleted by all those 21st century lifestyle factors. Fecal bacterium prausnitzi that he had on the slide is important in the colon. I'm adding anaristipes casei as being another peacekeeper important in the small intestine. These bacteria ferment dietary fiber to make short chain fatty acids, including butyrate. And butyrate has a lot of function, a lot of different effects on the immune system, but the overall um, influence of these bacteria is to maintain the barrier. In the absence of these peacekeepers, you have a more uh, ability of opportunistic microbes or toxins to, to gain access 
to the rest of the body, so to below the epithelium, as well, I've added here um, opportunistic, uh, the ability of food antigens to reach the circulation. So now there's a, a lot of, of startup companies that are interested in developing microbiome modulating therapeutics. Um, in, this, in this report, in this review called Microbial Active Pharmaceutical Ingredients. And the question is, how are we going to approach doing this? Um, I'm sure uh, uh, Professor Fischbach told you uh, 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 something about this. There's a lot of different ways you can approach this. You can use engineered bacteria. You can use small groups of bacteria that are characterized. You can use larger groups of characterized bacteria, or you can use um, total fecal samples as has been fecal transplant has been very much in the news. So regardless of what bacterial population you use, you have to determine how you're going to formulate that. And remember that all of the bacteria we're talking about are oxygen sensitive. So that, that's a big problem. How do you get an oxygen sensitive bacteria out of the laboratory or the pharmacy and to the patient? Is it going to be given in a capsule? Is it going to be given in a liquid culture? Is it going to be given by mouth? Is it going to be given by enema? What's the dosing regimen? How many bacteria do we have to give? At what frequency? For what duration? All of this will have to be determined empirically. And it's, there's nothing really to guide us. A lot of different groups are trying different approaches. We've tried a, an approach um, at Cluster Bio that is that I'll tell you about in the next few slides. So Cluster Bio was founded uh, in 2016 by myself and Jeffrey Hubble, who's, who's a uh, materials engineering expert. We are now fortunate to be joined by John Flavin as our executive chairman, who's also the CEO of, of Portal Innovations, a new uh, startup incubator in Chicago and guided all along by the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And Cluster Bio's approach is uh, to drug the microbiome. We've created a polymeric platform that's a delivery vehicle for microbial me metabolites. So rather than try to transfer these oxygen sensitive bacteria, we're trying to transfer their metabolites. And our drug, is schematized here, has a backbone, a synthetic backbone that provides stability and solubility and allows us to control active ingredient release, a linker chain, and then the capability of adding a bacterial metabolite. The advantage of this approach is that it's antigen agnostic. It doesn't matter what your food allergy is. Our platform is flexible. We call this a plug and play module. We can put in any metabolites we want. It's a tractable and flexible synthesis. There's no toxicity expected. The components of this are either endogenous, the short chain fatty acids everyone has in their gut or generally regarded as safe, the components that make the background bone. And there's very low systemic absorption of any part of, of, the, of, any part of the polymer. We know that it aggregates into my cells so that the hydrophobic portion that contains the active ingredient is protected at the center of the micelle and the inactive carrier is in the corona. We've scaled up, uh, we've begun scale up work. We're, we're, we've got product from a contract manufacturer. We know how to make it under GMP conditions. We have composition of matter patents pending that cover all major pharmaceutical territories. So let's go back here. The metabolite we chose to begin with is butyrate. I've mentioned butyrate quite a few times. Butyrate is clearly one of the most important bacterial metabolites functionally in the gut. And, but it's been almost impossible to work with as a drug 
because it's absorbed very quickly, well before the intestine, and it smells and tastes terrible. So we had to, to deal with all of those issues. And in the drugs that we've prepared, um, we've, we've obviated all of those problems. So our polymer has no taste, no smell. And we're able to, do, in two different formulations that are chemically different, deliver butyrate specifically to different parts of the intestine. So what I'm showing you here is, is mass spectrometry measurements of butyrate in the contents of the last part of the small intestine, the cecum, which is between the small and large intestines, or the colon. The red line is, is what's already there at baseline. Everybody has butyrate. The black lines are the butyrate we're delivering with our drug. And you can see that our two drugs are very different. CLB-001 in, introduces butyrate into the ileum. It's released in the ileum very quickly and at high concentration, but it's gone by four hours. Whereas CLB-003 is released at high concentration at the cecum. It remains high over a very extended period of time. And some is also detectable in the colon, but we imagine that, the, that this high concentration and, this, and prolonged concentration provides a continuous outflow into the colon. So given this information, we, we, wanted, we wanted to take a, a first pass at treating food allergy. And the only therapy currently available for food allergy is oral immunotherapy. And what happens in oral immunotherapy um, the lead investigator of oral immunotherapy is in Palo Alto, where many of you are. That's Carrie Nadeau at Stanford. And this is actually from one of her, uh, her papers. She's a collaborator of mine. And what uh, she's pioneered in oral immunotherapy is that you give a very, very small amount, tiny amount of the food allergen to an allergic patient and slowly increase that amount with the caveat that they can have an allergic reaction at any point as you increase it. You get to a certain plateau where you maintain still a very, very low dose of the allergen. And then you challenge it and look to see if you have desensitized them. It works to some extent. There are safety concerns because um, many patients react during the updosing phase. And it's not clear that this, that oral immunotherapy as it's currently practiced leads to long-term tolerance. You have to continue with, with lifelong maintenance dosing. And as I told you, our argument for why oral immunotherapy doesn't work on its own is that you also need to address the underlying barrier protective response. So the experiment we did was to give our drugs, CLB-001 and CLB-003, together with peanut oral immunotherapy in a mouse model to see if we could enhance the efficacy. And what I'm showing you here is the drop in core body temperature pre-treatment. So unlike the other slides, we've sensitized the mice for the same four week time course. Then we challenge them, demonstrate that they're allergic, and then we begin the treatment. So the squares are the two pre-treatment groups. They're different groups of mice. We separated all of the, the mice that were sensitized into a group to be treated with OIT only, that's the blue, or a group to be treated with OIT plus our drugs. And what you can see is that the mice that got OIT plus our drugs had a very small, significantly decreased drop in core body temperature. Whereas that was not true in the mice that got OIT alone. So this is, was very promising to us to pursue. And, and this is the indication we're going forward with to develop our drug into an investigational new drug application and into clinical trials. So I'll end by thanking all of the super smart young people that have contributed to this work um, as shown here, as well as um, 
the various funding agencies that have supported and I'll supported it and I'll be delighted to take your questions. All right, thank you, Catherine. I think we'll get jump right into questions here. So it looks like a few have already built up in the chat and I'll start with one right here. Could the microbiome still be helpful in curing genetically predisposed food allergies such as celiac disease? So celiac disease is not a food allergy. Celiac disease is an inflammatory response. So it's not IgE mediated. Um, I, there's not a lot of information on the, on the role of the microbiome in celiac disease, but the microbiome influences so many responses in the gut. I would be surprised that it doesn't also, if it doesn't also influ, influence the response to uh, gluten. Great. All right. Um, here's another one. Do RNAs from digested foods play a role in the development of allergy and how might the microbiome influence those roles? So do what from digested food? Do RNAs from digested foods play a role in the development of allergy? And how might the microbiome influence those roles? So the digested foods, um, antibodies only see, the rules of the immune system are that T cells see peptide antigens and antibodies see intact antigens. So digested foods are not going to stimulate and immune response. That's why we were so surprised to detect intact peanut allergen in the bloodstream. So anything that remains in, in peptide form, whatever it is um, in the gut is not going to elicit a response. Otherwise we'd, we'd all have food allergies to, uh, to many different foods, not just those top eight that I showed you. Interesting, interesting, okay. Hope that answered that question for you. Um, here's another one, a little bit more on the technical side. So forgive me if I don't pronounce exactly the right way. It says, how close is the phylogenetic tree using 16S RNA versus the entire bacteria genome? Are there cases in which there would be a divergence similar to 16S, but different genome altogether? Did, did that make sense? I may yeah, not have- That makes yeah. total sense. So, okay. um, six so uh, this very smart questioner is, is pointing out that uh, 16S ribosomal RNA uh, technology is limited because it's only sampling a very small portion of the genome as opposed to the whole bacterial genome. And one of the problems we're working with Clostridia and obligate anaerobes is that, especially in mice, they've not been well characterized. So for a real aficionado, if you were looking very carefully at my data slides, I wasn't able to classify a lot of these bacteria down to the genus level because the information is not present in the database. And so, yes, metagenomic analysis would give them a much better indication of exactly who is there and what they do um, than 16S. And we are, my lab is just in the process of switching over to metagenomic analysis from 16S. We feel like you might have thought that we've done everything we can do with 16S and it's time to move on to really study the genomes of these bacterial populations. And with that information, be able to tell so as an example, one thing we're very interested in, and we have some evidence that the flagellin, the, the tail that helps bacteria to move is one of the ways that, that clostridia signals to the host and regulates the immune response. And we've just surveyed uh, many different lactospiraceae for their presence or absence of flagella. And we can do that by metagenomic analysis. Great. I think that was a good question. You're obviously very passionate in answering that. Thank <laughs> you for that one. Um, here's another one. Pretty interesting. It says, does a newborn consuming breast milk versus formula have less risk of developing allergies slash intestinal issues? And if they consume breast milk, does the mother's diet or exposure to diverse foods have any effect on whether a child might develop allergies slash intestinal issues? Are allergies hereditary at all? 
That's three questions, all great ones. I should have emphasized that there is, there is definitely a hereditary component to allergy, but I didn't emphasize that because uh, heredity doesn't change in a generation and that, mm. can't, that can't account for this dramatic generational change that I'm telling you about. Breast milk is um, protective against many diseases. The microbiota is set up, nature set up the, the development of the microbiota in a very beautiful way that depended on the founder bacteria coming from the vaginal tract and the next population of com bacteria coming in is particularly specialized to um, use particular proteins in breast milk as its food source and dependent on the products of the lactobacilli um, that preceded it. So all of that change of microbiome colonization and development is disrupted when the babies don't have breast milk. And in fact, the babies in our study, the Italian babies, only had two weeks of breastfeeding, all of them. And um, we did an experiment with the one, uh, uh, one pair that we could find with breastfed, uh, transferring the feces from a breastfed uh, allergic, healthy or allergic infant. And we could see easily that the microbiota of a breastfed infant is very, very different from the microbiota of a formula fed infant. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, here's another one we have here. It says, what can be done to treat a chronic leaky gut, SIBO, and IBSD type symptoms where mast cells seem to be very reactive? Uh, so I, I don't want to say leaky gut. You didn't, and you didn't hear me say leaky gut because that's a, a kind of, of popular science terminology. So even though I showed you a picture that look like a leaky gut, we have to understand that that's not what happens in reality. If you have, if you actually have a leak between your, your a sp a gap between your epithelial cells of your gut, you, that, that's not compatible with life. So there's not leakiness, there's more permeability, but there are particular pathways that proteins have to use to to be able to gain access to the gut. It's not simply leaking. So given that caveat, um, what we're trying to do with our drugs is reduce the permeability of the gut to um, dietary antigens. So we think that this strategy will be beneficial to a lot of different diseases where there's impaired barrier function like inflammatory bowel disease. Um, possibly neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease. Hmm. SIBO, is it, uh, SIBO, if you're referring to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that's, um, that's a different problem. That's more of an infectious disease problem. I, I don't know. Our drug could possibly treat patients with C. difficile colitis, hmm. um, but uh, SIBO probably not. Okay, thanks for the clarification there. All right, and I have one last question here that I was kind of saving because it is a little bit of a personal story and it seems like uh, the person who asked here would like to just know for their own personal sake. So I, I think it's pretty interesting. So it's a little bit of a mouthful here. So just bear with me. It says, my daughter became highly reactive to foods after being treated for giardiasis with two rounds of flagell. Her symptoms were similar to severe IBS D, this then evolved to food intolerances, which did not show in typical allergy lab work. After many years of suffering chronic fatigue, brain fog, and food reactions like IBSD, she has had vitamin deficiencies and hypothyroid. Finally, a DX of mast cell activation syndrome. How will she start to heal what seems to be now also SIBO and severely out of whack gut biome? Random dosing of pre or probiotic does not seem to help and can make things worse. What would you recommend? Do I, you do I, anything there? <laughs> no, I don't, I'm not a physician, so I, I'm not going to make any recommendation uh, be, uh, because I'm not qualified to do so. But I would say that, that our 
mast cell activation is uh, is not. I wouldn't say it's directly influenced. We don't have evidence that it's directly influenced by the microbiome because that's the end result of of having a an altered microbiome. You're already way down the pathway when you have have uncontrolled activation of mast cells. So I think at that point, um, modulating the microbiome is not going to help. But one thing I want to emphasize for, for is that when I talk about the lifestyle factors, we have to think about the changes, the 21st century lifestyle changes on a community level, not on an individual level. So sometimes when I give my talks, a, a mother whose child was born by C-section and then developed food allergies comes to say, oh my gosh, um, did my C-section cause this food allergy? I don't want anybody to think that way. We have to think about how the, the because we share our microbiomes with each other, how our lifestyle factors have changed our collective microbiomes and how we can start to reverse that trend. Probably not by restoring the microbiome of the last generation, but by, by restoring its functionality. Perfect, thank you. All right, I think we'll actually wrap up here. So thank you guys all for tuning in to Virtual Cafe Sci this evening. And thank you, Catherine, again, for taking the time to speak with us. Um, you know, food allergies in the microbiome are quite the topic. It looked like, uh, based on the chat, our audience definitely enjoyed the content and learned something new tonight. Um, for the audience, I hope to see you guys all back next month for our next Virtual Cafe Sci. Be sure to register through hauntahouse.com and have a great rest of your Thursday evening. I look forward to seeing you guys again. Take care. <laughs>